For a change, uh, we'll take a look at what happens in our backyard today, and uh, more specifically in Hanover. So uh, we invited Chris Soderquist, uh, who is from uh, Pontifex Consulting. Uh, Chris is a system dynamics practitioner and a longtime member of the Sustainable Hanover Committee. He worked for many years at the Hanover-based firm High Performance Systems that developed the Stella software and now applies system-based approaches to numerous public policy issues, childhood obesity, obesity uh, child maltreatment, correction system reform, and national energy infrastructure transformations. Uh, Chris has studied mathematical methods in the social sciences at Northwestern University and used to work with Barry Richmond, uh, former uh, faculty at their school, as well as Donella Meadows. Please. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon. Um, so I start off, uh, you know, first of all, just uh, thinking about the fact that, you know, I kind of approached a uh, Friday afternoon at 3.30 talk with some trepidation, particularly knowing for some folks that maybe sort of asked forcibly to be here that I'm standing between you and happy hour. So um, hopefully you won't hold that against me. And the other thing that, you know, comes to mind as I was walking over here, I just live over across the street. Um, is uh, the song uh, Once in a Lifetime was coming into my mind and was saying, my God, you know, how did I get here? Like, how am I, why am I here and doing a presentation here in the afternoon? Um, you know, again, keeping you from happy hour. And, um, you know, as, as Alex said, I worked for uh, High Performance Systems, Barry Richmond. I worked for Danella Meadows. And uh, as a, a person living in, in, in Hanover, um, you know, I'm very concerned, obviously, about the environment and where we're at. And I just had a, a colleague, a friend of mine, Drew Jones, who's also an alumni from here and is a member of Climate Interactive, posted a Danella Meadows uh, quote, which I thought I would just read to you because I just saw it and I thought it was of uh, relevance. And um, Danella Meadows said about uh, issues around environment, particularly like climate progress, Fostering a transition to sustainability will not be simple because unsustainable behavior does not arise simply out of ignorance or irrationality or greed. Often it results from the collective consequences of rational, well-intentioned decisions. People and organizations are caught up in systems, complex social structures ranging from families and communities to corporations, governments, and large-scale economies that make it difficult or even impossible to act in ways that are fully responsible to all who are impacted in the present and in the future. Most of us do not have the information, the resources, the incentives, or the freedom we need to live sustainably. And it was the, the sentiment that was in there is the sentiment that led uh, us at the Sustainable Hanover Committee to start working on what I'm going to be presenting to you today, which is thinking about getting on the path. And the getting on the path, I think, will make a little bit more sense in a second as we talk about that. So. Um, Let's just talk a little bit about the, uh, the purpose for today is to uh, really present to you this uh, overview of a process that Hanover is using uh, around an emissions pathway, a reduction path to guiding sustainability efforts. And we'll walk through, I'll show you uh, the context, you know, where this came from, some scenarios that, uh, you know, we're using, uh, you know, to kind of base our, our pathway on. Um, I'll, I'll definitely show you a tool that's developed in Stella I'll also show you this big honking spreadsheet that we used that we got uh, you know, information on. So you'll see the data that's, uh, that's there. And at the end of it, there'll be an opportunity to think about how might this work or not work in other communities? What's some of the, the challenges and what are some of the opportunities that are out there? So you know, hopefully by the end of this, um, you'll see what we've done. Um, we'll talk about context-based sustain context sustainability indicators. I'm not sure if you're aware of those. Um, and look at some strengths and limitations. So you'll have some, some things to walk away with. Um, before getting much further, how many of you are familiar with system dynamics? Have it had any impact? OK. So uh, that's, that's helpful. Again, I, my background, I worked for uh, Barry Richmond for many years. Uh, that's where I trained to, uh, to apply system dynamics. And uh, um, you know, still miss uh, sort of his his intelligence and his uh, his enthusiasm for uh, building system dynamics uh, understanding in, in the world. So that's kind of where I come from. So today, the focus is going to be on practice. Um, you know, so thinking about what's required by those developing and implementing strategies to reduce carbon footprints um, at a community level or a regional level. Um, you, what you're going to see is still in its initial phases. We really just have version one, or maybe you know 
I would say it's like in beta version or pre, you know, pre-final version. So we're still working on it. Um, there are some multiple approaches to doing this. We tried to balance the practical with the aspirational. So how do you do something that's doable given the data and the limitations? And as you or as researchers know, there's always limitations on data, what's available. So given that, how do we you know, also set some stretch goals that can help um, you know, guide efforts? Um, we'll look at some uh, interactive uh, opportunities here in terms of some scenarios. Um, and there, you'll, I'll be very honest about some of the assumptions and compromises that we had to make as we went through this process. So um, you'll, you'll see you know, what those are. Um, I'm coming to you as a community member, and hopefully many of you are also community members here for a longer period of time. So I'm not coming here with sort of the truth and laying down this is exactly perfect and this is what's to, to be done. Actually, I'm looking to engage the community, engage the, the wisdom here at Dartmouth to help take what I'm calling version one and somehow collaborate in a way to make it version two and make it better. So you're going to see all kinds of flaws and opportunities for improvement as we go through here. Great, let's talk about how to make those happen. What I'd like to suggest is kind of write those down, and we'll wait till the end of the Q&A, and you can start raising, here's a flaw or here's an issue, and we can talk about them then. So that'll help make sure that we actually have time for the Q&A. So the context, back in 2010, um, Hanover, uh, you know, we've established the Sustainable Hanover Committee, which actually is a um, sort of an evolution from what used to be a recycling committee. So the Sustainable Hanover Committee kind of transcended that and not only focused on recycling, but started to think about larger issues around energy consumption, emissions, not only waste, and even moving into using the natural step as a process, thinking about um, sort of the vibrancy of the social and the economic capital that we have here. So um, we were trying to think about how do we operationalize those lofty aspirational goals into something that's going to mobilize, to galvanize people to move forward and to do something. So that was what was coming on at the sustainability uh, side of it for the Sustainable Hanover Committee. At the same time, what was once called Sustainability Institute is now Danella Meadows Institute. They were looking for some opportunity to develop and test out potential regional-based planning tools for planners and for community leaders to think about some sustainability goals. They didn't have anything in particular in mind, just how do we um, contribute to sustainability with some kind of a planning tool. So, Fortunately or unfortunately, depending upon your perspective, I happened to be a partner at uh, doing work with the Nella Meadows Institute. I'd worked with them on commodity system modeling. I looked at shrimp and corn aquaculture, uh, shrimp aquaculture and corn commodity systems. Um, and so I was also on the Sustainable Handover Committee. So there was kind of a, a marriage there, so to speak, and uh, you know, kind of easily accessible labor in me. So uh, we, we decided that we would try to come up with something together. And we held a power up to power down workshop where we invited people from a variety of organizations around here. You see they're, they're listed there. You know, folks from Dartmouth, we've got Dartmouth Hitchcock showed up. We had uh, bike committee people, and we even had high school students show up. So there was a variety of people that showed up. And as a result of that, um, we were asking, you know, what kinds of things sustainability-wise around the goals did you think would be the most interesting to focus in on or the most important? And the confluence came around energy and emissions, and in particular about energy and emissions for residents. And this was stemming from the fact that there was, uh, you know, studies done at the town level in terms of what's the town's energy and carbon um, you know, usage and footprint. Um, and organizations like Dartmouth and Hypertherm and others have also done some interesting, useful studies that are giving them that data and information. But there's nothing been done on the resident side. So that was, the, that was kind of the, the, the purpose of that, was to let's do something in that area. Um, so let me just uh, kind, of, kind of move this into um, an area here. Um, let's see if that will take me over. Oh, good. Um, and I'm going to show you, you know, as we thought about engagement in terms of, okay, how are we going to use this and engage the, uh, the public, you know, we had to have some kind of a theory in mind, a theory of change. And um, we kind of based it a little bit on a, a system approach. So for those of you not familiar with system dynamics, we use the system dynamics mapping language to think about engaging people and making change. So if you think about a 
stock of people, for those of you familiar with stocks, you know, you know they're like bathtubs. These are things that accumulate. So we have you know, a, a bucket of people in the system that are actually contributing to those goals that I showed you before. They're active, they're engaged, they're contributing and doing a great job. If you think about um, a group before that that's active, you know, they're recycling or they're composting or they're doing a few things, but they're not really heavily engaged and contributing um, with goals in mind, um, then you might want to figure out some way of opening up the valve, the flow between them, so that you get more people moving from the active into the contributing to goals. So thinking in terms of, okay, we want to get more people contributing. If you think of more and you move back to, we've got aware but inactive. These people are kind of aware that sustainability goals are important or aware that sustainability is important, but they're not really even doing much. Um, how do we get them to be at least active? And then ultimately, there's folks that are unaware of things like or don't believe, perhaps, that climate change is an issue. They're back here, so we've got to move them a long way. So if you think strategically from our perspective as the Sustainable Hanover Committee, we can think about allocating resources to a variety of these flows. That's the strategy, OK? Do we focus on making people more aware? Do we make people become more active? Or do we really establish some stretch goals and put them out there and give people the tools and the opportunity to move forward? So we kind of use this as a way to think about it. And you know, thinking about the dynamics is that the more people you get down here who are actually active or contributing, there is a feedback loop process. You can probably get more people aware. Obviously, there's some balancing loops where people kind of push back and you know, they don't want to be aware, they don't want to believe something. But you can see a, a reinforcing loop, perhaps. So how can you maybe crank up the awareness multiplier, make those people more effective at selling? Um, and activities to make aware. So one of the outcomes of the Power Up, Power Down workshop was to think about what kinds of tools or activities could we use to make people more aware. Um, similarly, if you think about a, a stock or a, an accumulation of clear actions and initiatives, these are things you can do, these are things that should be done as helping people become active and become contributors, then identifying those and establishing clear goals can help to identify those. So, we can move into further back in terms of what are the clear goals and how do we establish those. People who are contributing, people who are active, can help to identify those goals. And uh, particularly, those who are contributing to goals are probably more likely to build clarity. Those are the ones who really have probably a stronger vision or understanding. So how could we, as a committee, figure out ways to perhaps get people who are active becoming more contributing to goals and becoming clearer about those goals and helping maybe to get a cycle going where we could get some sort of virtuous cycle. And that was kind of establishing um, sort of the, the, the thinking behind um, you know, where we were headed with this. So as a result of the meeting, um, we were looking at um, how to expand the scope on the residents to get more groups involved, get more people contributing to goals and actually doing it. Um, and how could we educate the public about sources of emissions? So that's kind of getting people to be more aware. How can you motivate uh, and improve the data gathering activities? So how, again, making more aware, but also maybe even making it a little bit active. Um, getting dialogue going between stakeholder groups. And in particular, how can you focus people on saying, I want to do this. This is exactly, I'm going to set a goal for my particular um, you know, number of miles that I drive a month, or I set a goal for you know, sort of the amount of local food I buy, or whatever it is, to set goals or pledges, particularly from different groups, and to think about what the levers are um, to help achieve those pledges. So that's a big set of things there, right? But they're, they kind of laid out on that, um, again, diagram that I put forth. So how do we do that? And so we decided to work together again with the town of Hanover. Um, and we pulled in people from here, um, worked with uh, Steve Shadford, who's over in the facilities. Um, we had Dartmouth Hitchcock and Vital Communities, um, Sustainable Energy Resource Group, uh, Bob Walker, Surge, bunch of folks involved. And over the course of several months, we did interviews. Um, we um, actually worked with the Hubbardbrook Foundation that had a, a nice report on carbon and communities, which I'll show you in a minute. Worked with the state of New Hampshire, Clean Air, Cool Planet folks, a bunch of folks. Um, and then synthesized that into a model that we were developing. And I'll show you the model in a little bit. Um, 
And then we did some reviews, and we're kind of now in the point where we're out there hitting the road. This is the, the road to the community that we're on, and that's part of why I'm, you know, again, my God, how did I get here? That's why I'm here. Um, I had no idea it was you know, something that was recorded and was going to be put up on the web. I just thought it was going to be speaking to get you know, some folks engaged. So um, we're out here doing this type of work now, trying to get folks engaged. So the sustainability journey is we first asked, what should our target emissions be? If we're going to start talking about emissions and we're going to start talking about energy, what should our target emissions be? And even if you set something as like, OK, we're going to reduce our emissions by 50%, that doesn't necessarily answer a question of sufficiency, right? There's multiple ways to get there, right? You could, um, if your current emissions are up here and you want to reduce them by 50%, you could pull them down. Um, but you know, you could take years to pull them down, right? You could take you know, 30, 40 years to pull them down, maybe less than that. Um, you could have something where you just wait till the very end, and then you come up with the, the Hail Mary, and you, you know, completely reduce them all at once. Um, or you could keep growing for a while, and then bring them down, or you could gradually. So there's multiple ways to get there. And the question then becomes, which, which of those is the appropriate path? And how do you judge or evaluate that? And there's, again, many people have different ways of doing it. But we were thinking of going back to the, uh, uh, again, the, the UN framework from way, way back and looking at how can you stabilize greenhouse gas concentrations at a safe level. You know, that's sort of the ultimate goal that we would like to be able to contribute to. How can we at Hanover do our part in that? So what we did is we reframed the question to address systemic orchestration. This is a term coined by Barry Richmond which is thinking, what should the magnitude and timing of our reductions be, rather than just what's the total? So magnitude and timing, how it plays out over time, is as important, actually more important probably, than just sort of, OK, we're going to reduce this. Particularly if you think about the fact that you know, if this is the stock of CO2 in the atmosphere, um, you know, the inflow is the emissions, right? And the outflow is the, is the, is the, is the sequestering or, or, or pulling of the carbon out of the atmosphere. If this is still greater for a long period of time than this, you're going to have it grow. And the longer you wait, the worse off you're going to be. And that's the thing that we're seeing, is we're seeing this growing exponentially. This is you know, kind of like this, or actually decreasing. So CO2 is going up like this. So even if you wait a few years, you've lost some opportunity. So thinking about that sort of pathway is really important. So, we then said, OK, now how do we then anchor a pathway? What's the best pathway? There's multiple ones, perhaps. And we looked at some stabilization scenarios. And there are many out there. The one that we chose was the Wiggly, Richels, and Edmonds one, where if you think about um, the different potential, again, stabilization of CO2 levels out there, um, you can think about um, you know, stabilizing at 750 parts per million, or you can think about returning back down to the 350 parts per million, which is what James Hansen and other climate scientists, um, you know, Bill McKibben and others are saying, this is where we need to get. So if that's the case, then the emissions pathways then can become clear. And again, WRE, um, again, prescribed some emissions pathways to get to each of these different levels. This one, which is scaled over here to tw almost 2030, right? So it's a long way out, suggests that you can continue growing for a little bit, um, but then you would then have to um, reduce pretty dramatically um, and actually reach some sort of negative. So there's some Hail Mary or there's some additional sequestration or other kinds of things going on here, but you'd have to figure out some way to pull it down. Um, and eventually, you could stabilize emissions here and stabilize CO2 concentration there. So at the committee, we're trying to, again, be the good citizens, the good global citizens of the planet. So we kind of shot for that one. We're like, OK, let's, let's go for it. So these become prescriptive models. And these prescriptive models then can help, um, let's see, it's not moving forward, are kind of lead to what we are describing as a context-based sustainability indicator. Um, so what we developed, and I'll show you this in the model, but we basically determined you know, what's the threshold? In other words, what's the uh, amount of emissions that would be required based upon, um, again, per capitalizing it, thinking about it globally? Um, if it's coming down here, this is what we need to be, and this is where we are. So you can use that to create a, a, you know, a quotient, right? So the, the amount you're at relative to the amount that you're supposed to do, 
that divides into a very simple number, and it, it, it uh, allows you to think about, you know, if it's greater than one, you're not sustainable, and if you're less than one, you are. And this is um, based upon some work that um, was actually done at Ben & Jerry's um, through an organization called Sustain Center for Sustainable Organizations that, that helped us out with this. And they created this, this quotient type statistic um, that Ben and Jerry's was actually calling the global warming social footprint, and you can go to their website and you can you can find this on there. But it's a they were applying it rather than at a community level like we were going to do. They were applying it at a corporate level. So um, we'll talk a little bit more about that as we lay it out here. But the the, the tool itself that I'm going to show in a moment, um, I'll talk a little bit about the the breadth and the depth of the tool. Um, some of the assumptions that are in there, um, and then the tool design, and we'll walk through some of the, uh, uh, some, some examples. But before getting into that, I just want to be clear about models. I want to be on the same page about how we're approaching models and uh, how I'd like to see us approach models here in the afternoon. If you think about models, you know, some people look at it cynically and say, well, that's only a model. Um, our situation is different or unique. There's not enough stuff in it. Therefore, it doesn't apply. It's not useful. And that's kind of a cynical approach. So all models are wrong, so we toss them out. Then on the other side, there's folks who think that if you can build the right model, you're going to predict the future. And those folks on the mystical side scare me in my work, I'm a system dynamicist, more so than these folks. These folks, you can actually almost get these people, they're like, you know, you can predict the stock market. I can predict that JP Morgan is going to, you know, um, not uh, you know, meet $2 billion or something this term, right? You know, they, scary. So you, you, don't, you don't want to do that. Um, so instead, you know, adopt the frame, at least this is what I'm adopting, that you know, we're using models all the time to make decisions. Those models are filled with assumptions. Usually they're implicit, not tested. Let's create a process by which we can globally, collectively reach those assumptions that we like and buy into. And then what are the implications of those? In particular, computers are very good at then showing what the implications of assumptions are. They're not necessarily good at identifying assumptions. We have to do that. But they are pretty good at then simulating them. So all models are wrong. Some are useful. George Box, Ed Deming, uh, that's the approach that we're taking here. So the model that I'm going to show you in a second, it's wrong. There's lots of holes in it. The boundaries we set could be set a different way. We could have different levels of detail. But hopefully, it's on the road to being useful for helping us think about how to make some sort of decision. So fortunately, as, as we got going here, um, what we found was that a local organization called the Hubbard Brook uh, Foundation um, had actually done a study called Carbon and Communities. And they had looked at a variety of Northeast communities. They looked at um, both um, communities that are kind of in the, the Vermont, New Hampshire, and they also looked down at the Baltimore area. And they had very simply looked at sort of industrial, commercial, transportation, residential, and land as sort of sources of emissions, and had figured out a pretty nice protocol for quickly identifying the data um, through census, through uh, you know, state data, EPA data, other kinds of things to at least start to make assumptions or assertions about different regions. So um, we decided to adopt that approach rather than just going out and putting up a survey and starting to just spend a long time through analysis paralysis. Let's just get some information and start using that as a foundation so we can move forward. So you'll see something interesting here. Um, Grafton County, which they did, um, of all the counties except for Baltimore, the city of Baltimore, the emissions per capita was higher, which I thought was kind of interesting. And you can also see sort of where um, the types of sources were emissions, so transportation more so than um, just pure residential, commercial, and industrial. Um, they had a bunch of recommendations here, um, largest source being transportation, um, suggestions, you know, basically that, uh, you know, as counties are developing, energy efficiency is going to be more and more important, things like that. Um, I recommend the report, um, but, um, you know, again, per capita emissions are generally lower for urban areas, but not for our county, which I thought was, you know, kind of interesting to, and we'll, we'll get into that in a minute. So, as we went through this, uh, the, uh, the process of identifying, okay, what's in the, the model? What are we going to kind of focus in on in terms of emissions? 
we drew our boundaries, and all boundaries are permeable and in, incomplete or inaccurate, but we put in the boundaries of what we would be interested in, residence, town services, commercial, and industrial. And then Dartmouth, well, the 500-pound gorillas in the room, like we couldn't just keep them separate, so, or are in, included in the commercial area, which is where academic institutions often fall. So we pulled that out. Um, so that's kind of the, uh, the, the sort of the stakeholder or the, or the groups. And then within each of those, looking at some of the sources of emissions from those groups. So focusing on the fuel, electricity, transportation, and waste. Some of the things that we had to exclude or think about, there may be some you know, already balking at this as you look up here, um, but we were looking at um, not really trying to figure out the commuting miles in and figuring out how to do that at a more regional level, which is I think where this is applied rather than at a town level, which is kind of tiny. Um, you can get more and more into how is the public transportation, how is the, that kinds of, um, you know, sort of interacting between multiple communities um, better worked on. So we, we really kind of left the commuting in and out and only focused on the miles responsible that, from people within this group. Um, looking at, uh, at agriculture, we didn't focus on the agricultural side in our, our uh, town area. And in terms of waste, we really only looked at CO2 equivalents um, and didn't look at some of the other associations of, of waste there, yes? What does GHG stand? Uh, greenhouse gases. Yes, thanks. So in terms of data, um, as I said, step one, make a reasonable first pass assumption. So again, we could take time and, and go out and do a survey and get everybody to say, okay, I drove this many miles this year, and you know, this is the, uh, the amount of uh, garbage that I'm you know, throwing away, and this is my electricity use and all that. That can take time. So instead, we used the Hubbard Brook Foundation um, approach and did some uh, you know, found local reports, and that was step one. Step two, went to uh, the town of Hanover, got their reports, worked with Dartmouth and Hypertherm and others to uh, refine and improve the data. And where we are now is using this tool that I'll show you as motivation to improve the quality of data. So we're showing it to folks. We're going to start putting out surveys and other things to improve the quality. So it's a process of improving our understanding of the data and assumptions as we go. So um, we could spend an hour on this. Um, I would not like to, because then we wouldn't get to see the tool. Um, but the, I have a list of detailed assumptions about each of these um, you know, areas of fuel, electricity, you know, how we got uh, and separated out Dartmouth. Um, they actually had a nice spreadsheet that we used. Um, we used census data to, to make estimates based upon sort of regional purchases of different types of fuels to figure out, um, again, what might be allocated to residents, what might be allocated to, uh, to different uh, you know, commercial entities, you know, excluding Dartmouth and others. So we, we used um, census data to figure that out. Transportation, we had registered vehicles. Um, we just basically applied initially the uh, average VMT miles, you know, vehicle miles traveled. Um, we need to find out better data on that. Um, and uh, again, Dartmouth and uh, other organizations kind of knew sort of the, the transportation usage in their uh, sphere of influence, so we could get that. Um, residents, we just used the national per capita average to start with. Dartmouth did have some data. Um, Hypertherm had data. And uh, we actually looked at the waste treatment plant and other parts of that in terms of how much energy they're using um, as well as what they're processing. Um, and then there was a oh, pretty recent 1984 report on land use. Um, that's unfortunately the most recent one that they've got. Uh, we tried to use this granite data, but it was uh, you know, at too aggregate of a level to get into. So it would be nice. You know, a lot of the master plan stuff going on in the town of Hanover is based on assessments from clear back in 1984. So that should be really encouraging. Um, so with all of that combined, what we end up is with this big honking spreadsheet. And uh, I'll spend a, a second or two kind of just showing that to you. Um, but this, this spreadsheet allows us to kind of look at the town summary and we can look at it in terms of and over the course of years um, the amount uh, coming from residents, Dartmouth, um, town services, et cetera, and then by different types. And so you can start divvying it up and figuring out where it's coming from and what might be a higher leverage place to intervene. Um, if we walked through this, you would see that you know, in different places, you know, what we did was you know, we had data on certain things. We had to make some assumptions based upon either past 
potential growth of the town or future growth, making assumptions about, I don't remember, it's like 1% growth a year or something like that, into the future. So when you don't have the future unfolding before you, you have to make some reasonable assumptions about that. And so that's how we populated the potential futures, is based upon some ideas of, of growth. Um, and then we had Dartmouth's, um, you know, all of their different types of uh, waste and uh, cogen steam and all the different things that were going on here. Um, and again, we could spend an hour or two going through this data and I'm happy to do that afterwards, but we probably should, should go and actually see the tool, um, which is over here. So um, actually I should go to, um, back to the presentation real quick here, which um, we can kind of look at. So how can we communicate the impacts to a less technical audience? So one thing we thought about doing was linking the scenario pathways to more visceral implications. And that sounds um, all fancy, but uh, Climate Interactive, which uh, was a model that was based by, by Drew Jones and John Sturman from MIT and others, Dahom Fiddeman, um, who also went to Dartmouth, um, they developed a climate model. It was reviewed by a, an independent panel of scientists. And this model allows you to say, based upon different scenarios of emissions, what might you see in terms of concentration and impacts on temperature and sea level and other kinds of things. So in the tool that we've built, we're kind of focusing locally, but we're able to say, if we were able to sort of extrapolate this at a global level, you can then give people, okay, if everybody did what Hanover is doing, sea level would go like this, temperature would go like that. And so we have in here an ability to sort of provide instant feedback at the global level. So I um, thought that would be an, an interesting thing um, to be able to do. And so in the tool design itself, um, back to those goals that I talked about, if you thought about the four different groups, one thing is to make aware, to set some context, Another one is to kind of get people moving down the pike. And then if you're at the level of a planner or you really, really are ready to do something, then what are some of the levers for improvement? So the tool we've designed is unfortunately right now a one size fits all. And two things about it. One is I am a modeler. I am not a graphic designer. I'm not like the guy who does the little polar bear thing or something really cool. Um, you know, I've just, I can make PowerPoint spreadsheet or um, slides, maybe. You might look at these and go, no, you can't. Um, but I, I'm not really someone who's going to develop a really cool, fancy tool um, that looks great. So what you're going to see in a few moments you know, tries to accomplish all these things. What we want to do is to kind of extract parts of it out, you know, put a little piece up that might be useful for one audience, another piece for another audience, or, and we'll kind of talk about that. So there's opportunities for extraction um, and obviously improvement in the way it looks. So, um, you know, the first tool is kind of designed to get people in the general public to just make a commitment to change. We want to change. We want to make a difference. And I'm ready to learn how. That's kind of the first piece. The second piece is, okay, how much should I pledge? How much should I reduce transportation? How much should I reduce waste? How much should I reduce my energy usage? Um, whatever. How much should I contribute? Um, and this could be, again, at the individual level, or it could be at a corporate level, right, an organization. So it's not just the general residents. You know, the next piece is, okay, if I want to reduce transportation, what's the best way to do it? Do I ask Hanover to subsidize the public transportation system so that it's running on Saturdays and Sundays? Or so that it's later at night so the people that work at Dartmouth-Hitchcock don't have to drive because they work a little bit later than 5 o'clock or 6 o'clock? What are some of those particular things within uh, an activity? Um, and then figuring out sort of uh, you know, where, where those uh, um, actions might be. And then finally, if we want to, um, you know, again, focus in on you know, individual vehicle driving, um, or if we're at Dartmouth you know, and we want to reduce our uh, emissions, you know, do we buy wind? Um, you know, do we invest in that? Um, or do we you know, do something you know, completely different, install solar panels, whatever? So at a more granular level, you know, what do we do? So this is designed to kind of move from just, OK, there's a big issue and I want to make a difference, all the way down to here's the exact types of things that I could do. So the tool can allow you, or the idea is to have tools and facilitated sessions um, or self-guided sessions that will help people to do those different things. So um, you know, that's the, uh, 
um, the, the kind of plan. And let me just now um, actually spend a few moments showing uh, you know, what we've got. So here's the tool. And again, you'll see immediately, not beautiful. Uh, but this is, you know, this is what we got. Um, and the first screen here is to, um, with, the, with regard to, to metric tons, to look at um, and simulate relative to, again, an allowable amount, which is this black line, what the business as usual line looks like it might be into the future. Now, um, you know, this is based on data from the past. Um, the WRE started at um, a baseline year of 2005, so we kind of tried to backtrack based upon information. You'll see there's a little dip in here. Does anybody know what that little dip in here from 2005 over might be? 2005 to about 2009 or so? What? Yes. Um, and in fact, it's, if you notice, it's dipping 2005, 2006, before the recession. Um, and uh, working with Chris Goglin and others at the New Hampshire Department of Environmental Services, he said, yeah, that happens. Right before recessions, you'll see energy usage um, taking a hit first, often because I think you know, prices, like again, the oil prices were going up at that time and other kinds of things is kind of leading to issues and maybe some other things are happening. But you can almost determine um, if you're kind of looking at these things broad scale when a recession might occur. And you can kind of back up and look at several of them that way. So I thought that was kind of interesting. So thanks to the recession, actually, it looks like you know, we're pretty much on target for a while. We were, you know, if we were kind of using as an index year 2005, so we're, we're doing OK. We're kind of still on the path here. Um, and the other thing, which I'll show you in a minute, is that Dartmouth has been implementing and doing some things. And being the 500-pound gorilla in the room um, is actually also helping to stay on the path. So some things are in our favor. We're actually, if we want to follow this, we're OK. We're kind of on that. We're not behind the eight ball already, which is the good news. Um, what you can do is you can go over here to see global implications. And you can see this blue line is sort of the rest of the world, kind of not pan over. So if everybody operated like the rest of the world is going, particularly with the developing countries of China and India and others, projections are that CO2 would go like this. This red line shows like, well, if the rest of the world you know, again, with 2005 as the baseline operated um, as Hanover would, then it wouldn't be so bad. Okay, so that's what the red line is. Does that make sense? How far does this go out? So right now, yes, that's a good question. It goes out to 2050. Um, and then this is the temperature change um, and then the sea level rise. And unfortunately, if you go to, there's actually on the Climate Interactive website, I won't go there now because I don't think we've got enough time, climate momentum, you know, this one you can shift you know, if you, this is hard to shift, but if you shift this, it shifts this sum, and then it shifts this less. There's, you know, sort of a real cascading issue associated with it. So the, part, of the, part of the challenge is that this is going to go up, you know, pretty much no matter what. You can bring it down a little bit, um, but it's hard to motivate people down here because they're like, well, forget it. You know, we're, the truck is coming. I might as well, like, give up. Uh, but we need to not operate that way. There's, there's opportunities. There's time to bring this back to 350, and let's do what we can. So um, we can now go back and um, don't let your eyes glaze over. I know you're technical folks. Um, this probably won't cause your eyes to glaze over. It does cause a lot of the people that I work with, and that's because, again, I'm not a graphic designer. But if we move to the next level down in terms of just awareness of, oh, we need to do something, to how much am I or my group contributing, I created a screen here that allows you to compare sort of the business as usual future, projecting into the future. Um, and on this page here, um, an opportunity to try some different scenarios. So here you can look at, and again, this is the line we should be on. This is the line that it looks like we're heading towards. And given that um, you know, residents are contributing this much, the green is like Dartmouth, what Dartmouth is planning or is doing. Notice that they've come down. Um, and then we've got you know, other sectors here. Um, and this is interesting here. If you look at it in terms of the town and the percentage of contribution from the town itself in terms of you know, the trucks and the buildings and other kinds of things, there ain't a whole lot of leverage there. And one of the things that I think kind of jumps out at you is you can tell the town to do a whole lot more and become sustainable, and there's not going to be a, it's not going to move much. What about um, thinking about 
rather than putting money and time into weatherization of buildings or other kinds of things, what if those money and effort was put into an education process to get residents to drive less or, an educate or, or donated to infrastructure or something? And I'm not saying that it's impossible, but if you can think about it, you know, they can put a lot of money and time into this, they ain't going to move much. Uh, given that, um, what we can do is um, we can go over to another screen here. And on this screen, you can facilitate conversations among different stakeholder groups. And you could say something like, OK, if I'm a resident or part of the residence group, what if we collectively figured out some way over the course of the next 40 or 45 years? By the way, it goes to 2055, not 2050, I'm sorry, 2055. Um, if we could somehow or another um, reduce our emissions down to 42% of what we've got. So just the residents. OK, so the residents are reducing their emissions by, by you know, 60 or 58% or something like that. Um, what do you think is going to happen to um, over here in terms of um, you know, sort of the future um, allowed versus the, what we actually get? Any, any guesses? A lot, a little, some, medium amount of change? Just, OK, so it might be significant. Um, if we run that. Um, the line here, so just the residents, we bring the residents down from here contributing to this much percentage of the emissions down to this much, so we kind of reduce it by half. Um, that doesn't do much if, if Dartmouth and others stay operating the same way. So if they're doing business as usual, there isn't a whole lot. It, it's better, but you can then go over here and you can see the global implications. And this is now comparing you know, what we were doing before to now this new thing, and we we're not really moving the needle much over the baseline. So you can, um, you know, go back and say, okay, well, it's not just the, the residents. You know, what if Dartmouth not only just sort of swapped out and did less cogen electricity and steam and came up with some different types of things which they're doing, but what if they kept on this path and, you know, brought it down to here? Um, right now, I don't have this all obviously being a net emissions um, sequestration either, right? So what if they actually figured out some way to pull it in? Um, but we can sit now go back here, say, okay, now if Dartmouth uh, also pitched in, wow, that's a lot better. Um, the sustainability metric, by the way, that we're trying to get near one, the annual per capita one is at 7.7. .7. The cumulative weighted score is at 1.5. So it's more sustainable, but it's still not on the path. So, you know, what's a, what's a lesson that one can get from, you know, just kind of doing this? Okay, so now the contributors might be the um, commercial might also do something. What's, what's a, a takeaway that you'd like, you know, the town or folks to get out of something like this? Any thoughts? Right, yeah, it's all hands on deck. You know, it's an obvious one for you all. You know, I'm making almost a rhetorical question there, but thanks for playing along. Um, but it, it is, you need everybody working, right? You cannot just say it's Dartmouth's problem or it's the resident's problem or a lot of folks are saying, town, get your act together. It's everybody's problem. So hopefully by playing around with something like this, you at least start to get folks saying, okay, we all need to be involved and in fact, Let's make some kind of pledges. Residents, yes, this is the path that as residents we want to follow. This is the path that you know, we at Hypertherm, which makes up about 95% of industrial um, up here, this is the path that we want to follow, et cetera. Right, so um, thinking about that, if we wanted to, you know, everybody made some sort of pledges, you can start seeing, OK, now we're all playing together. We're all hands on deck. And we might have a chance. Okay, we can now you know, get on the path. So that's kind of the first step, is making aware of the problem, linking it to global context, and then thinking about what am I, how am I invested in this? Um, you know, we can then um, you know, go and make it go down a little bit further. Um, I want to show a few more things here. It's going to get more and more eye, eyes glazing over as I go. And it's, you know, at, this, at some point, it's getting to where you know, we need to sit down and have a, a pretty long talk about some of these things. But you can go to this page. And the page here is looking at, OK, we're residents, Dartmouth, whatever. What are our actual um, contributions? Where is it coming from? And uh, we can look at, for a residence, um, this line is the transportation component relative to heat or electricity. Um, Dartmouth, um, you know, the blue is the heating. 
Um, and then this green line here is the electric, or the whatever color line that is. I'm colorblind, by the way. That's another reason this looks so ugly. Um, you know, this line here is, is due to the electricity. Um, and you can see, you know, how they're moving forward with some good stuff. Um, but you can then, um, as, as a group, you know, residents can say, huh, we want to be on this pathway here, this black line, and we're not. So what would happen, you know, if we focus on our transportation and reduce that? Um, you know, now I can go out here and I can update and I can see, you know, sort of the implications. Oh, that's not transportation, that's fuel, sorry. I'm, I can't, not only colorblind, I can't read. Um, so we pull this down. Um, you know, we, we really focus on transportation, you know, carpooling, sharing, all that stuff goes on. And, you know, now you see that, you know, doing that, um, just focusing only on transportation can get the residents a long way on their part. If they've pledged this black line, this can show sort of where that pledge ought to be applied. Um, and so you can work on different things. Um, I also uh, created sort of, uh, you know, you, when you play a video game, there's always like these, uh, um, what are they, secret codes that allow you to get into places. There's a secret code down here where you can actually determine based upon what's kind of left over here, you can figure out what your offset ought to be that you could pledge if you really wanted to kind of buy into an offset kind of plan. Um, so that's kind of listed down here. Uh, so again, a little bit more sophisticated. Um, each group has an opportunity to do something similar, so Dartmouth commercial town on that level. So first piece, here's the big picture problem. As a community, we need to do this. This is the path for the community. Second level down is, as groups, this is the path that we want to be on to contribute to the bigger path. And then further down, if we want to be on this path, what are some of the things that we can do as people who are you know, residents or whatever to contribute to being on our path? So it's kind of a, a cascading pathway thing. Um, at the furthest level down, we can actually, um, and this is where system dynamics can be useful, um, and where this thing is still uh, very much not done, um, this is where you would sit down with different stakeholder groups like Dartmouth, um, like Hypertherm, or someone else, and to actually explore some of the initiatives that they might want to do. So um, I actually did have the opportunity to work with um, you know, the folks at the facilities. Here's some of the things that they're looking at in terms of biomass, um, on-site solar, um, you know, purchasing, um, you know, those kinds of things. So we can turn this on, and you can use, oops, you can turn it on, not off. And um, you can make some sort of a, a say, OK, what if um, we start purchasing wind in the year 2020? And uh, you know, this, we start push purchasing about uh, half of our um, offsite electricity comes from wind, at, and we start doing that in 2020. What would that look like? You know, so that we can uh, you know, start seeing, again, from strategic choices, where might we you know, want to be able to work first? You know, what might be some low-hanging fruit here to keep on the path for a while? Um, or what might be some high leverage interventions that can get a big dramatic? So you can start using system dynamics modeling as a way to kind of lay out those options and explore them um, in a more strategic planning approach. Um, and that's, you know, that's kind of the, 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 the tool in, it, in itself. And um, we can kind of go back to this in a little bit um, you know, when it's time for Q&A in a second, which it will be. Um, but you know, the idea is that we've got um, you know, folks that are kind of in the sustainability planner realm would be interested probably in the last one that I just showed you, right? Okay, where's my levers? What do I want to do? You know, I'm the town planner. I'm the sustainable handover committee. I'm, you know, the folks in the facilities committee at Dartmouth, whatever. What are my individual levers? And they kind of want to operate down at this level. General public might need to be kind of moved along, and they can kind of operate there. So, you know, an option for kind of moving forward is to say, okay, let's start with these groups. This is kind of what we're doing. And squeeze to the middle so that we're kind of moving from, okay, detailed people like Jenny Levy at Hypertherm or other folks, um, you know, moving back this way, and they, they then engage some of the people in their organizations around some things, and this is more of a general uh, public kind of approach, squeeze in the middle, and, you know, that's kind of the, the thoughts that we have. So that's kind of laying out the, the big picture plan, you know, we're kind of moving forward. This is all part of that moving forward. That's why I'm here. That's the Again, this, the talking heads uh, you know, thing, why am I here? Um, 
is to really get out the idea that we're just starting, we want to raise awareness, we want to pull everybody, all hands on deck, and uh, you know, start working on this together. Um, some thoughts you know, based upon my uh, blood, sweat, and tears in this is that, uh, uh, first of all, and I did some work with the uh, Clean Air, Cool Planet people, um, and again, the state of New Hampshire, and in all those conversations, it was, well, you know, Hanover is nice and neat and tidy, but you know, you're kind of ahead of the curve and you're tiny anyway. Who cares? Um, but you know, we care. Um, but if you think about it from a more regional perspective, you can operate and think about the transportation stuff, right? So you can think about it at a more regional. So thinking about how to expand this at a more regional level, there may be more leverage in that. Um, spreadsheet that we developed, um, you know, again, um, as you, anyone knows who does data, you know, as crunch time comes on, you do less and less annotating and less and less really making it nice and neat and tidy. The spreadsheet, though, could be created in such a way that other communities could use it and apply it, right? So, you know, there's all the data sources are from the EPA, um, census, and other kinds of things. You could first populate it with that, and then, uh, again, do what we're going to try to do, which is to move more into the, uh, the survey side. Um, you know, saw a talk a few weeks ago from Cameron Wake. You know, he actually was showing different regions in terms of tree loss, um, you, know, um, you know, more rain in the spring and more rain in the fall, less rain in the summer, you know, impacts like we're seeing now in the last few years, um, and also impacts on agriculture. It'd be kind of nice to take those things that are being put out there by that climate interactive model, and then again, link it back to what does it look like in Hanover in 50 years if we do this or we don't do that? So you could actually picture it. So not only did sea level rise, but wow, you know, I can't play golf anymore, or worse yet, I can't ski, right, or something like that. So you can really link it back to. Um, and I think communities could work on developing a, a version sooner to, you know, to engage the community. So you know, we're still, we had folks in the community engaged, and then we kind of went off and did this work and took a while. We worked with organizations, but keeping the community engaged longer and maybe getting surveys out there sooner, I think, would be you know, something you know, useful. So that's the, um, that's the Evelyn, you're the Evelyn Wood speed readers, and I'm the Reader's Digest Cliff Notes, you know, comp composition. We kind of met in the middle. Um, hopefully it was, uh, there was enough there that you could catch. Um, but uh, I have got enough time, I think, for some Q&A now, and more than happy to go in any direction you all want to go. So thank you. <laughs> yes, sir. Yes. Uh, yes, yeah, so we've. I, yeah, we, we've talked to the co op and uh, they were involved in some conversations, but we did not get their data and get it involved in there. But, you know, Emily Newman for many years was on the, on the Sustainable Hanover Committee, um, and, you know, now, now they're part of sort of the Upper Valley. So, part of the next phase. And again, as I showed you before, this is imperfect, right? So we're kind of looking at residents and transportation, but thinking about sort of the food coming in and out and some of the other things and how they impact that, you know, it's very important. So yes, we would like to, to do more with them and, and get that involved in the model, yes. There was a, there was a, a step in the process that I didn't follow, which was you went from the allowable global emission to get to 350. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It looks like that line is partly not just taking the global population and dividing the total emissions by the global population to figure out the individual share. Yeah, so I'll, I'll try to recall how this is done in the model. And, you know, um, again, I'm thinking of happy hours. So. It, what, what's going on is, is uh, you know, if you think about emissions sort of being a, a, um, an actual um, number that you want to keep down to, we, we do have in the model global population also going with it based upon census projections. So starting off in the year 2005, figuring out what the per capitas are associated with that, we're then able to um, sort of relate that back to um, what the per capita was in, the, in Hanover at that time and how that projection would go. So there's, a, there's a, a relationship in the model that makes sure that as the global population rises relative to what emissions should be. There's sort of a per capita amount, and that's then compared to the Hanover line, so that the Hanover so, is taken up. So you're, you're essentially holding constant the ratio of per capita emissions in the U.S. versus per capita emissions in Africa? Yes. Yeah, so the, um, 
And that's exactly one of the things that I want. Thanks for bringing this up. This is, this is to me is an interesting thing. And somebody was talking about this today on a, on a listserv that I'm involved with the context sustainability stuff, talking about the tool. The one thing this doesn't do that I think is absolutely essential and needs to be done, particularly in affluent communities like this, is to think about, because basically what you're saying is, you know, a person in Africa in 2005 might be emitting like, you know, nothing or very little and they also have to reduce by a certain percentage sort of globally. So this doesn't address the inequity issue whatsoever. Um, and you know, there's, a, there's a huge moral issue right there in, in that. And in presenting this, um, I actually want to be more obvious about doing that. And I'm, I'm sorry for not doing that, because I think it's a really important point. And this model should be shown that you know, not only do we want to kind of follow what the global ought to be, but in Hanover, because we're doing so well, we should be well below that, because you know, we should be allowing some other folks to come up. So good, good point. Yes? Yeah, and, and I'm not actually advocating any particular um, you know, type of, uh, of an approach. Um, I did some work with the uh, Biomass um, uh, Energy Resource Group or whatever, Burke over in, in Vermont. They're all on board with this idea. I, I kind of don't think that biomass is, is the actual approach. And I was only including biomass in there because that's on one of the options that Dartmouth has on their plan. And it also was listed in the Carbon and Communities report as something that they thought was an option. So I was just putting that in there. I'm particularly not advocating the biomass front. I think that that's not um, sustainable in the long run. And there's certain issues in terms of the amount of carbon released versus actually sequestering and how long you actually get it. There's a report um, from Massachusetts, and the name is escaping me now, that kind of pointed out maybe some fallacies or issues with it. Maybe you're referring to that, but it's in the last three or four years. Um, I can think about that and, and email it to you if, if you want. I've got a copy of it somewhere. But yeah. Yeah, currently, this is not the standard system dynamics model that says, you know, as conditions in the community change, it becomes more or less attractive for people to move in or out. I'm just saying, okay, let's start here. Let's assume that population continues to grow sort of what it has been, which is something like a percent or something a year, and I'm just projecting that out into the future. Similarly, with businesses, I'm assuming like a, a nice, you know, I don't know, it's 2% or something economic growth, and that that's, again, translating, so I'm not in... in embedding any efficiencies or productivities in there. So it's translating in the same number of employees per economic output so that we're kind of keeping the employees. So, you know, all models are wrong. You're just trying to make some projections to work off of. It's possible. I haven't done that. Yeah. You know, then, then we just have to go out there and talk to the banks and just say, "Keep doing what you're doing." We can we can see that soon. Yeah. Yeah, so uh, that's, that's interesting. I actually haven't done that because all my models are still, you know, I'm trying to be optimistic, but, you know, that, um, yeah, you, you probably could do that. I haven't actually tested that out, but it should work that way. Yes? Has, has anyone looked at, uh, instead of changing our habits of consumption, reducing population and see if we meet the uh, target? Um, no, no one that I know of, although the climate... Um, C roads model that I referenced in there probably could do it in terms of again thinking about the population. This, you know, I, I haven't even tested this one. It, this one probably could. I could set it up to uh, to reduce the population, and so if we just keep the per capita, it should test that out. I can't say so. One of the things, by the way, that I thought of doing with this, and if anyone's interested in talking to me because they think it's a good idea or it's a stupid idea, um, either one's fine. But you can, can create something similar for the individual, right? Like, so, you know, I'm just taking this idea. It was used for Ben and Jerry's. It's used for the community. Why couldn't it also be used for the individual? If you can assess where you are 
and you want to say, I'm Chris Soderquist, and I want to make sure in 30 years I've done my part to reduce to 350 parts per million, you can contextualize that down to the individual level and say, OK, sell your cars, first of all, or whatever, and figure it out, and come up with like a, you know, like an iPhone app or something. I don't know. But you should be able to do something like that with this, I think. Well, yeah, if, if I'm missing something, you know, somebody slap me upside the head, but I think that's possible. Yep. yep. And here's my uh, contact information. Feel free to send stuff. Thank you very much. Appreciate your time. Thanks, Jay, for showing up.